Thanks to everyone on the panel. That was really great. I believe we have about 15 minutes for questions or so. Um, let's see what the, my, the magical timer says. 15 minutes. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And I believe, there's a glare up here, but I believe I see one microphone, I see another microphone. And so I think maybe the things to do is to ask people to go to the microphones if you want to ask questions, engage with the panel, um, both to help the audience and also to help the help the, 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 the people at home. And also, it looks like we have a good number of people going to the microphones. And so if you could keep your question um, brief and to the point and make it a question, um, not, a, <laughs> um, not, 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 a, not a statement, unless um, you would like to engage something one of the panelists <coughs> said. So I'll, I'll just start over here, and then we'll go back and forth. Yes, sir. So, so Nate. Nate. Oh, also, if you could identify yourselves just so we can, and maybe give an affiliation just so we can get a sense about. Uh, David Sontag, a new faculty member at MIT. Uh, so, for Nate, uh, what information do you get from the pollsters themselves? So, uh, what is published with the polls that identifies their methodology and the, popula the precise population that they're, tar that they're polling that you would then use to integrate the information? I mean, in theory, it's only information contained in their press release. So, you know, all we really require is the top line numbers for um, for Clinton and Trump and Johnson and Stein, if they're included in the poll, the dates of the poll, the sample population, meaning registered voters or likely voters. Um, and so, in theory, it should be simple. In practice, sometimes um, you'll find mistakes and typos. Sometimes you'll find references to the Johnson vote, but it's not included in the press release. Sometimes also the pollster's not clear about who actually did the poll, right? Um, you know, the field poll is a very good poll in California, for example. Um, they put out a poll the other day that was actually an online poll done by YouGov, which is also a good pollster. But we consider that a different poll than the telephone field poll. And so, you know, there are more situations than you would think when we need to, to clarify with the pollster. Yes. Yeah, uh, I'm with the External Advisory Board. My name is Goldman. Uh, I have a question for Nate. And I wonder if you apply your 538 model to the Brexit results and that feedback allow you to refine your forecasting mechanisms. I mean, if we, we have learned by experience to avoid making forecasts in the UK because the polling year <laughs> is not very good. Um, we didn't have a Brexit model. Um, if we had, then maybe we would have had a polls only and a polls plus version, and the polls only version would say, hey, it's a toss up. Um, people who built models said that, well, historically, ballot initiatives, the status quo side, the no side, tends to win. That was the, that was the contention. Um, to me, it's not so clear how robust that was. I didn't really examine it myself. Um, you know, I do think it's noteworthy that uh, outcomes that elites don't like. I mean, models involve making assumptions. Mm -hmm. um, and when you make assumptions that, in that case, seem like kind of a fairly sui generis kind of event, right? And, you know, I'm not sure um, how much I would have bought that. But again, easier to say in hindsight, I have one record on a podcast where I'm like, I did say I would take. Uh, leave at the odds offered on the betting markets. But that was about two seconds of thought beforehand, so I don't want to appear too smart alecky after the fact. But it does surprise me that we have had, um, I thought we were going to spend a lot of time, 538 would, saying, oh, you can't take the primaries as a perfect precedent for the general election. Things are really different. I thought people would overcompensate and overrate Trump's chances. And if anything, I think the conventional wisdom is a little bit in denial about how much the race has tightened. And Clinton, Clinton is a favorite, but people have trouble grasping that a 40% chance of Trump winning, or you go to betting markets a little lower, even a one in three chance is a, that, you know, 33% is a lot. Um, and people have trouble wrapping their heads around that. Great. Yes. I'm Boaz Barak, faculty at Harvard. I was wondering how much, this is, I guess, both on NATO, Cassia, how much true uncertainty is there in this race? For example, if you were to have a face-to-face -face talk for an hour with an undecided voter, how well do you think you could predict what they, whether they'll actually show up and whether, who they'll vote for? What do you think? I mean, I would love to hear from you about how many voters you think are really persuadable. I mean, you know, yeah. I think 
Yeah. Yeah. Cass. So generally, when we start, uh, when we decide whether or not to go to talk to a particular voter, the first thing that we would do is look at our modeling, you know, to make that determination based on what we know about that individual. Do we believe he or she to be persuadable or to be sort of a mobilization target, someone that we think is highly likely to vote in our direction if they manage to get to the polls, and. I guess the only uh, contention I would make with your statement is I don't know that we have time to have a one-hour conversation with every voter, unfortunately. <laughs> I wish we did. Um, but I think generally, in practice, we make the determination very quickly. In 2012, I think there was a little bit of research that we did where we asked volunteers after they spoke to a persuadable voter, how receptive do you think this individual was? And it, general, it was generally pretty good. It wasn't perfect. But people did, again, volunteers, you know, not trained political scientists or anything. But people did seem to uh, have a pretty good sense of whether someone was hearing their message and was, re excuse me, was receptive to it. Great. Thanks. Yes, please. Cynthia Dwork from Microsoft Research. I wonder if the panel could do what hasn't been done so far, which is discuss the role of gender in this race. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, as a starter, what kind of data do you have that you would, you would use for this? What kind of data would you need to collect for it? And uh, what have you learned so far? So I'll dive in and say that I think gender is certainly a factor in this race and uh, public perceptions of Hillary Clinton. I don't want to get into specific data, but one of the um, a, a parallel I might draw is in 2008, when President Obama was first running, there was a concern that latent racism uh, was something that would affect the election results that wasn't being captured in polling. In other words, people were reluctant to say, I don't want to vote for Barack Obama because he's an African-American man. And there was a bunch of research done trying to get at that in oblique ways, saying things like, um, do you think people in your neighborhood would be less likely to support Senator Obama <laughs> because of race? There are some interesting findings from that. I imagine some of the same work is being done now. Yeah, I mean, um, from my vantage point, one of the big questions about the election is is not why Trump is so popular, because Trump isn't that popular. He's the most yep. unpopular candidate ever nominated based on his favorability ratings. But Clinton is the second most unpopular. <laughs> um, and trying to kind of infer is, can you explain that without reference to her gender and the fact that we've never had a woman president? You know, I, I don't know. Um, you know, my view as a, as a white male is that, um, first of all, racism and sexism manifest themselves in, in different ways. I think sometimes racism's a little bit more overt and sexism isn't, and that makes it harder to identify in some ways, right? Whereas you know some voter perceptions and some ways the campaign is covered, you know in the aggregate it almost certainly reflects sexism, but it's hard to point to any one thing and say, oh, the way the media reacted to Clinton's health scare, you know, that's one where intuitively I think it probably had some effect, but it's kind of, it's hard to prove the case. And, and for whatever reason, there's been a lot of research on how race has motivated voting behavior, both obviously with President Obama and with Trump. Um, and the sexism question is frankly badly understudied. And, and I'll, I'll just chime in from the academic perspective really quickly, because um, I, I, I think this is a, a very, very exciting question. And it's something that, you know, on, on, in my own research we're, we're looking at, although we're not, I'm not quite as interested in, in gender per se. I mean, we've done some work in the past on the gender gap in presidential elections, but more interested in, in, in the why question. You know, why is it and how is it that both the genders of the candidates and the way gender is being used in this race um, are, are shaping people's decisions. And right now, uh, well, I have a, research, a student back in my research group who's doing laboratory experiments on trying to understand the role of race and emotions um, in, in candidate choice. And we're also running panel surveys right now where we're asking uh, you know, large samples of, of voters a, a variety of questions about the issues that I think are behind some of the, the, the fear and, and, and concerns, uh, in particular immigration and um, economic insecurity. And so again, gender is definitely going to be one of the factors we look at to try to filter out why is it that, that we're seeing uh, gender and race playing these roles in the particular ways they're playing in this campaign. Yes. Hi. 
my name is Hussein Mohsen from Enernoc. Um I had a, a theoretical question for all of you. Um, the work that you have presented is really interesting, very convincing, um, very solid. Um, but I'm curious about your thoughts about, is there space for a more analytical or mathematical modeling? Uh, so the analogy in physics, it seems like a lot of what you're doing is almost experimental. You're trying to measure something experimentally and kind of measure it accurately, which is the voter behavior. But is there a place for more sophisticated models, you know, something almost like a, a very vaguely like almost like a hidden markup model or hidden model um, that will try to, that is not directly dependent on data, only learns from data, but that, that could produce better results? Is there a space for that, do you feel? So Mike actually might have some thoughts on that based on his, um, his book and some other things he's well, I'm actually sitting here staring at one of my former colleagues, Matt Jackson, who's in, in the audience, who, who might actually want to speak to this kind of question later on, where in, in social science, we have formal um, social science, which is more mathematical models, which is the sort of thing that, that you know, people like Matt are, are specialists in. And then we have the data side. Um, and, and we, you know, for various reasons, those parts of social science have largely been siloed. Um, and, and so, you know, they, they don't, we, until very recently, they haven't spoken well together. And I think we're getting to a place where there, there are a number of folks who are trying to marry the, the interplay between the kind of models you're talking about, which actually are used in, in, in electoral politics, um, studying electoral politics, and, and the more data-driven approaches. Um, and, and I think that's one of these, these sort of new exciting opportunities is, is to sort of develop this, this sort of interplay between theoretical, complicated theoretical models and, and data analysis, because we can now do that with the kind of computing power that we have. My take on it from just from the campaign side is that we have a perpetual tension between campaigns are very fast paced, things happen very quickly over a very short period of time, and we sometimes have to just provide 80% of what we could get if we had six more months to work on a particular model. So it, it depends on the particular context where you are doing this m more sophisticated work. Um, if you are trying to tell a campaign how they should you know, spend money on their television advertising, there's some advantage to just having your best guess now as opposed to your really, really, really best guess six weeks from now. The same is true in, in journalism, by yeah. the way. I mean, we have to do projects that take place in intervals ranging from minutes sometimes when we're trying to update our forecast on election night um, to weeks or, or months at most, but usually time frames of days to weeks. Um, and that we use that phrase, you know, what's the 80% solution here? And the key is understanding when is the 80% approximation a good approximation? That's right. And when is all the value defined in different ways in that missing 20%? Mm -hmm. Yes. OK, um, very, very interesting. Sally Benson from Stanford University. So I'm curious about the question of the influence of other issues on the ballot on the outcome. And so I guess number one, does that have a very big influence? Uh, number two, do you include it in these models and what kind of granularity, you know, how important are really local issues, state issues and so forth? Um, and then the, the third part of that is to what extent in modern politics are we seeing campaigns working on other, you know, sort of adjacencies on the ballot that would draw out their voters? Um, Academics? California. Yeah. yeah. This is a California <laughs> politics question. And, and the answer is that, as you know, because you must vote in California, that, uh, you know, there's been quite a history um, of state politicians using the, the ballot, ballot initiative process to propel their issues forward as well as their candidacies. I mean, I think the best example of that was Pete Wilson um, and the anti-immigration yeah. ballot measures back in the 1990s. Um, well, and, how did and, that go for him? Sorry. It, exactly. I mean, you no, know, it, it went really well for him in, in, his, in his election bid, but it also backfired in the long run. So I think they're, they're definitely um, uh, very important in California politics. To what extent they're, they're incorporated into the models, I don't know. Yeah, I, again, very contextual. It depends on the situation. I think rather less so than you might expect. I think. The again, what, when we do this type of work in the context of a political campaign or for a labor union or other organization that's active in a particular election cycle, we are focused on this question of return on investment. How can you best spend your next dollar in order to help move a vote in your direction? And a lot of times, again, 
as I just said, with the short timetable, is you're looking at what the best guess is. And we can get pretty far along that road just thinking about kind of the top of the ticket, which tends to be where this work is happening. Yeah, my, my view of modeling in general is that um, if you build a model, you want to be able to kind of um, taste every ingredient, so to speak, instead of having them all blend together. Right? We could say, well, let's make some semi-ad hoc adjustment because there's a, um, a bear baiting ballot initiative in mm -hmm. Maine, which will drive more. This happened, by the way, 2014. Mm -hmm. Will drive more conservative turnout. Right? I'd rather say, here's a model that's you know relatively simple based on a few things that we understand why the model <coughs> behaves as it does. And then maybe if I were betting on that model, then I'd maybe say, you know what? If you're laying a bet, maybe I bet on the conservative side because of bear baiting in Maine. But I think it's important to kind of, um, you know, anytime someone says, um, oh, a model has a mind of its own, right. unless it is like an agent-based model where you have, where you want to capture emergent behavior, then I think that's usually, usually dangerous. Good. So um, it's the job of the moderator to take away the punch bowl when the party is getting good, and <laughs> excuse me, which is um, what has um, fallen upon me. I see there are folks who still want questions, uh, ask questions. We have another panel right after this. I believe our panelists will be around um, um, today and let's hope during lunch. And so um, please keep up the conversation and um, let's thank the panelists once again.